Fire dispatch, what's the location and nature of your emergency? Yeah, hi, I'm at 17 Ridgecrest. My husband just fell, he collapsed onto the floor. What I want you to do is keep him calm. I'm gonna dispatch an ambulance to your location. Fire dispatch on the air from Medic One and Engine One. Need to respond number 17 Ridgecrest. For the 49 year old male, altered mental status, previous unresponsive. Stand by for dispatch, Medic Three, Rescue Seven, and Car Six. Sepsis is worthy of national attention because there's 1.7 million cases of sepsis each year in the United States, and among those, there's 270,000 deaths. One of the most startling stats is that one in three patients who die in a hospital have sepsis. Car six is in route, Ridgecrest. From a CDC perspective, sepsis is not just a medical emergency, but it's also a public health issue. Medic three responding. We also want people to understand what the scope of the disease is. It's a big disease that we all should be thinking about. So I was on a call the other day. We got a call for altered mental status. This is a patient who had not been acting right. His wife calls us. Altered mental status could be anything. Historically, sepsis has been thought of as a disease that's treated in the hospital, but most patients develop sepsis before they get to the hospital. On average, about 50 to 60% of all severe sepsis cases are transported by EMS before they get to the hospital. One of the greatest misunderstandings is that sepsis means there's infection in the bloodstream. Sepsis is the body's overwhelming and life-threatening response to an infection that can lead to tissue damage, organ failure, and death. Sepsis always begins with an infection, but it's not the infection that is the heart of the problem. Just like in anaphylaxis, some people will get stung by a bee the life threat isn't the bee sting itself, it's the body's overreaction to the bee sting. Hi. Hi. EMS winds up seeing more patients with sepsis than patients who are having strokes or heart attacks. So first responders can have an enormous impact on care that patients receive. In a lot of EMS systems, the EMS providers are really the primary care providers for the community. In some situations, EMS providers are obtaining blood cultures and even administering pre-hospital antibiotics. One of the frameworks we use to teach EMS responders to be on the lookout for sepsis is to look at the patient's chart. C for chief complaint. The chief complaint sounds like infection or shock. We want to start asking more questions. Ask questions about the patient's H, history, their past history, of infection or use of antibiotics and the history of the present illness. Most important things are knowing anything about infections, recent infections, recent medications, recent antibiotics, any allergies to antibiotics, and knowing what those allergies are, finding the source of the infection is critical. So we're asking questions. Has anything changed? No, nothing. Any recent injuries, anything like that? A minor cut, okay. How did that happen? Well, it was up clean in the gutters, cut his hand, it wound up dirty, and it might have gotten infected. And it turns out that the hand, instead of getting better, was getting worse gradually. And then they started to notice that the husband wasn't feeling quite well, and then he wasn't acting right, and that's when we got called. Then A, for assessment, we're assessing those key vital signs. What we're really looking for specifically is any vital signs that pertain to perfusion, blood pressure, mean arterial pressure, pulse rate, respiration rate, and tidal carbon dioxide levels. If you can take them, serum blood lactate levels. We're looking at pulse oximetry and temperature. Unfortunately, there's no single test to identify sepsis in emergency department, hospital, or even during pre-hospital care. But you need a constellation of clinical signs and symptoms and suspicion for infection to make the diagnosis. Sepsis is a collection of different things that you have to look for and put those red flags together to be able to call a sepsis alert. Get ready to sit you up, get you moved over onto our stretcher, get you on the way to the hospital, all right? Things can go from very subtle and low to downward spiral into shock. Reassessment is key. Reassessment is ongoing through the transport. Reassess those vital signs every five minutes, even if a patient looks stable for now. 
It's not always sepsis, and even if it is sepsis, it doesn't always progress to septic shock, but it can progress so quickly, it can be easy to miss when those vital signs start turning downwards. Like any vital signs for any patient, one individual vital sign gives us only a limited amount of information. What we really need to do is see how those vital signs trend. We're gonna let the hospital know that we're on our way in, okay? And we're looking for R, red flags. If you have sepsis alert criteria, those are your red flags right there. If you don't have sepsis alert criteria, your red flags are any of those key indicators of perfusion. Even a simple hand laceration, bacteria can get in there. An otherwise healthy person, and they wouldn't have put together that connection between just cleaning the gutters and getting a cut and altered mental status needs to go to the hospital right now. I have a little more work to do. My next thing is I'm gonna start an IV, okay? Finally, T. Treatment. Our primary treatment, if we suspect sepsis and septic shock, is to start administering fluids. We need to give aggressive fluids, but we need to give measured quantities, 30 milliliters per kilogram. When we have an infection, our body's response to infection causes the lining of our blood vessels to become leaky. Then fluid and blood leaks out of our blood vessels, and that fluid that should be going to the heart, the kidney, the liver, the lungs, and the brain isn't going to the right place. And therefore, we administer intravenous fluids to support the blood pressure to perfuse those organs. But we need to be careful not to give more fluid than is necessary. It's important for EMS providers to know what their receiving hospitals see as sepsis criteria. The criteria for sepsis has two parts. The first one is suspecting infection, and the second part is understanding whether there's organ dysfunction present. So typically, we can measure organ dysfunction with things like vital signs and whether a patient is wakeful. Those are more objective and those are easier for our pre-hospital team to use. But to understand whether a patient has infection or suspect infection is much more challenging. In the time-sensitive environment in the field, we need criteria to identify the sick patient with organ dysfunction. There are a variety of ways of identifying sepsis in the field. How do we know the difference between somebody who's just sick and somebody who is septic? Well, the answer is a thing called SIRS, Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. There are specific criteria for SIRS, temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, fast respiratory rate, or a low end tidal carbon dioxide, any combination thereof but it really comes down to the fundamentals. Infection plus bad vitals equals? Sepsis. Sepsis plus shock equals? In the many different criteria that have been proposed for sepsis, there are new criteria called QSOFA, or the Quick Sequential Organ Failure Assessment Score. QSOFA is just a combination of vital signs. Vital signs can be rechecked often, and that's an advantage for QSOFA. Now, QSOFA involves just three clinical signs and symptoms, elevated respiratory rate, altered mental status or confusion, and low blood pressure. And the presence of two or three of these features identified the majority of sick patients who were at risk of dying. Paramedic Duckworth, inbound to your facility with a sepsis alert calling for a physician. Can you confirm, please? If an EMS system has sepsis alert criteria, one of the most important things for EMS providers to know is they need to say the words sepsis alert or code sepsis right up front. Emergency broadcast, code sepsis, bed one. Don't bury the lead. Make that the headline so that everyone listening knows everything else that is said pertains to that sepsis alert. In fact, a paramedic or first responder could notify the emergency department in advance that they're on the way and they're suspecting sepsis in the same way they might tell them that they have a patient with acute myocardial infarction. Code sepsis, I see you. Code sepsis, I see you. Everybody in the back of an ambulance needs to be a good patient advocate. When we arrive in the ER, we want to be able to say, this is a sepsis alert. Or if no system is in place for an official sepsis alert, we want to say, I suspect sepsis. So that the staff in the ER can pick up the patient at this point. If we don't have that collaboration, the EMS patient is going to be dropped off and the ED is going to start care all over again effectively moving the patient backwards on the continuum of care. Enhancing the partnership between pre-hospital care, the emergency department, and even the ICU is a key step toward improving sepsis outcomes. 
Some hospitals have a sepsis coordinator or specialty sepsis teams. They're not universally available. You may come to a very well-qualified hospital, but they don't have a sepsis specialist. There is no sepsis specialty like there are cardiologists. And that's why EMS is even more important as that first safety net to ask the right questions. He cut his hand a few days back and it really wasn't clearing up. One of the most important things to be able to help move this patient forward isn't any medicine that you're gonna give in the back of the ambulance. It's making sure that you identify sepsis with a good, solid assessment. So when your gut tells you something's wrong, continue that assessment and then providing that in a really good handoff to emergency department personnel. Let's get him over, keep the fluid bolus going, get his lab started. This is a time sensitive situation in which the important information about the patient's clinical status needs to be conveyed to the emergency department. In one to two minutes at most, an overview of the history of the patient, why infection might be suspected, how the vital signs are or are not abnormal, and what interventions have been done. This information can then motivate our team in the hospital to get things going, whether it's diagnostics, whether it's new blood tests, or treatment with antibiotics. When the signs and symptoms of organ dysfunction are present, the focus is really on treatment. And in particular, we're focused on getting fluids to the patient who's in shock and antibiotics to the patient who's at the highest risk of infection. Early administration of fluids and antibiotics has been associated with improved outcomes, improved survival in sepsis. Sepsis can be triggered by an infection from any kind of pathogen. It could be bacteria or viral. It could even be triggered by a parasite or a fungal infection. But the most common being bacterial infections. The most vulnerable populations are the very young, the very old, or people with weakened immune systems, such as people with diabetes or lung disease, or people that are receiving chemotherapy for treatment of cancer. About 70% of patients that have sepsis have underlying medical conditions or see healthcare providers frequently. One of the things that EMS providers really needs to know is that sepsis is the number one cause of hospital readmissions. When patients are discharged after an episode of sepsis, they're at risk of a whole host of things happening. One out of three of sepsis patients are discharged are re-hospitalized within 90 days. Sepsis is easy to miss because sepsis is so subtle and flies under the radar in the body. We can miss it until it suddenly becomes so obvious that it's sepsis that we've lost our opportunity to treat. There's no one underlying pathogen that leads to sepsis. There's no one underlying disease. And it can look different depending on if you're young, if you're old, what your risk factors are. All of these create a very mixed picture in the signs and symptoms in the septic patient. And so oftentimes we describe that case by the type of infection rather than describing the case as sepsis. The more we use the word sepsis, the more folks will be aware of it. All right, let's keep the fluids going. Let's get rain, draw a rainbow, two sets of blood cultures, make sure we have a lactate. I think sepsis deserves national attention because it's one of our most common and deadly conditions we see in the hospital. Many patients don't know about it, and we need to further educate our patients about what to look out for. And that's really gonna wind up saving lives. It's gonna wind up saving lives in the individual community. It's gonna improve morbidity and mortality, improve patient outcomes throughout the United States and really on a global scale. First responders have to be vigilant anytime they're seeing patients. First responders have to think about sepsis, not just when someone calls for an ambulance to be sent to the hospital, but even when they're just transporting patients. First responders are one of the most important parts of this system of care for sepsis. They're the first clinician to evaluate the patient, the first one to take vital signs and to ask an important history about whether infection is present. We're the ones who are gonna be putting together the big picture. That's really up to us to stay sharp for these patients. Number one, because it's the right thing to do. Number two, because the sooner that we can catch sepsis and the sooner we can begin treatment, the easier it is for this patient for their family and for all of the healthcare providers in the community. We're stopping it before it becomes a resource intensive, cost intensive course of care. I've got one last thing to leave you with, it's to be heard, spread the word, unrecognized sepsis kills. Thank you very much for your attention.